Well, oh, please welcome. Please welcome. Thank you very much for that introduction, Sagura-san. In my presentation today, I'm going to tell you about my experiences uh, writing Land of Japan, and I'll also describe some of the lessons that I learned uh, buying property in Tokyo, and why I believe Japan is still a very attractive place for foreigners to purchase property. I hope to help you understand how foreign buyers see the Japanese property market and help you serve non-Japanese clients more effectively. To do that, I'm going to look at the recent past uh, as well as the current market conditions and I'll also make some predictions about the future. Let me start with a little bit of background. Um, as Sugura-san mentioned, I'm a Canadian entrepreneur and I've lived in Hong Kong since 1992. I'm also the author of the Landed series of real estate books, uh, which includes books about Hong Kong, Japan, and China. Uh, the fourth book in the series, Landed Global, explains how to buy property across international borders. Uh, the first edition of my first book, Landed Hong Kong, was published in 2008, and it became a local bestseller in Hong Kong. About 95% of Landed Hong Kong was based on my experience buying and renovating an office, an apartment, uh, and a factory space in Hong Kong, which you can see here. That's the before picture. Um, the remaining 5% of that research was fresh research. Uh, this is what the factory looked like after the renovation, when it was turned into a multimedia studio. I published my second book, Landed Japan, in 2010, and that was before I had actually bought any property in Tokyo. Uh, Landed Japan was based on desk and internet research, interviews with uh, developers, agents, uh, lawyers, and architects, and also case studies about foreigners who had successfully bought property here in Japan. Using that research, in November 2010, I bought a 22 square meter apartment um, in Itabashiku for 4.9 million yen. That's uh, the building there. You can see the uh, Shuto Expressway in the background. Uh, the building was erected in 1974, and it came with a tenant who was a uh, retired civil servant. Uh, Akasaka Real Estate helped me with uh, the sale. And the insights that I'm going to share with you this evening are based on the research that I did writing the book, as well as almost six years of being a landlord here in Tokyo. Let me start from the beginning. Uh, from 1989 to 1992, long before I started writing books or buying property, I lived in Tokyo. I rented apartments in Koenji, which is still one of my favorite neighborhoods, uh, Ichigaya Yakuoji and Higashi Nakano. Um, that exposed me to, the, to Japanese real estate practices, uh, like the need for key money and a guarantor, and to the practical realities of Japanese apartments. Uh, while I was in Tokyo, I worked for a company that produced annual reports uh, for clients like <laughs> Nissan, <laughs> Mitsubishi Petrochemical, and uh, the former Bank of Tokyo. That's a long time ago. Um, that experience helped me understand how Japanese businesses operate, uh, and along the way I made some friends and developed a deep appreciation for Japan. Uh, when Landed Hong Kong was successful, I wondered what other markets I could write about, and I realized that Japan could be an interesting place to write a book about. And that's how I ended up writing Landed Japan and ultimately owning property here as well. So let me talk a little bit about motivation um, and the role that foreigners uh, uh, play in the Japanese property market and how that role has changed between the boom years when I lived here and today. Uh, specifically, I'm going to talk about foreigners' motivation for buying in Japan and the information and the services available to those buyers. Until recently, most of the foreign individuals who bought property in Japan were actually end users and were long-term residents. Uh, those buyers typically had a connection to Japan, uh, such as a Japanese spouse or an interest in Japanese culture that could range from anime to sumo. And that motivated them to overcome some of the difficulties that they faced in buying property here. They loved Japan. Um, as I said, the majority of those people were buying a home for their family. They weren't buying an investment property. 
like an, like an apartment block, for example. In addition uh, to a Japanese spouse, the early buyers typically had friends, co-workers, and an extended family to help them learn about the local property market, find an agent, and get a mortgage. Many of these foreign buyers spoke Japanese, and they worked typically for prestigious Japanese companies who hired them to help with things like international relations. Those companies could help the foreigners with in introductions to people like banks and agents and really smooth the way for them. So it was, but they were not really that many of them. They were quite a small in number, so it was fairly easy for the uh, local real estate industry to ignore them because they weren't a major market. In the late 2000s, uh, it became more common for foreigners uh, living in Japan to buy investment properties. And then ski resorts like Nisiko began to attract buyers from Australia, from New Zealand, from Taiwan and Singapore. Today people buy property in Japan from traveling exhibitions uh, in Hong Kong and Singapore hotels um, and from companies like Mitsui Furosan and Daikyo that have set up offices overseas. Some of these buyers actually buy property in Japan without ever having visited the country or even seen the property for that matter. Today's buyers uh, may have an affection for things Japanese, but they're also motivated by rental yields and by the desire for capital appreciation. And where yesterday's sumo or anime fan would look only at Japan because that's where those things were located, the new breed of buyers will compare Tokyo's nightlife with that in Sao Paulo uh, and compare Nisiko's snow with the snow in Whistler in Canada. These people are much less tolerant of Japan's quirks and idiosyncrasies, and if you make the process too difficult for them, they will look elsewhere and buy somewhere else. You really need to smooth the way for them. Another big change is the rise of the mainland Chinese buyer. Uh, many of these people want to move their wealth out of China, uh, and, their and this motivation can be more important to them than achieving capital gains or, or high rental yields. You may not know this, but by law, Chinese citizens are only allowed to take 50,000 US dollars out of or into China each year. Uh, and any amount in excess of that requires special permission from the government. Um, many, of, many of these people actually take money out of China illegally. Uh, they'll literally carry it out in shopping bags. Mainland buyers have a strong preference for new property and often buy homes overseas for their children. They also tend to be quite superstitious when it comes to avoiding the number four, for example, the fourth floor or a, an apartment with four in the address, uh, and liking the number eight, which sounds like success. Uh, they are also very sensitive to feng shui. Uh, so uh, an apartment near a cemetery, for example, would probably not do well with that market. And that sort of information is really important in terms of understanding that market. Um, but it's, it goes the other way as well. Those buyers are also really interested in getting information about this market. When I started researching Land in Japan, there was very little in the way of English language information available for home buyers. Uh, local real estate agents' listings were almost all in Japanese, and large international brokerages, the CBREs and Colliers and people like that, didn't really cover the residential market here. Mortgage lenders and developers were very much the same in my experience. If you could find information in English, typically it would be in a corporate report uh, or an annual, an annual report or a corporate brochure, and that information was interesting, but it typically didn't answer the questions uh, that somebody buying an apartment would have. At that time, there were exactly two books about Japanese real estate in English, and both of those were really in, written for investors. They weren't written for end users. Uh, the Nikkei Real Estate Market Report was very, very useful, uh, but it was also typically written for a corporate reader rather than an end user. Some Japanese uh, government ministries, like for example the Cabinet Office, continued to publish English language materials, as do trade bodies like the Real Estate Companies Association of Japan. I also learned the value of research produced by universities and think tanks and absolutely devoured stories in publications like the Japan Times and other media outlets. But most of this was very high level social and economic information and again as somebody who was looking to buy it wasn't terribly helpful. Things have improved a lot since 2010 
But if you do uh, an internet search for the phrase buy property in Japan, there's far less information available on the internet about Japan than there is for countries like the United States or for that matter France. And that's really an issue because many of the real estate practices here uh, that are normal are in Japan are actually kind of perplexing to foreign buyers. For, exa for example, zoning regulations that allow buildings or structures like these to coexist in close proximity um, are, are really quite unusual to a foreign buyer. Um, other examples include the explanation of important matters that's read when you buy a property here, uh, Japanese addresses, earthquake insurance, property taxes, uh, the, rain, the rain system, the use of paper and hanko based uh, processes when you buy something, Japan's tenant protection laws, and importantly, banks' reluctance to lend to foreigners buying property here. This is further complicated because much of the business that is done in Japan is done on the basis of trust. Uh, and to be blunt, foreigners generally don't have a high degree of trust for people in the real estate business. They tend to be quite skeptical of them. So that presents a really good opportunity for companies here and anywhere, really, who can build trust and provide clear, unbiased information to people who are looking at buying. And that brings me to service. Uh, when I started researching land in Japan, uh, obtaining any sort of service from local companies in Japanese or in English was really tough. I contacted literally dozens of developers, agents, and banks. Uh, some of them simply said, no, we can't help you, or some just ignored the request. Um, others gave me the runaround that you typically get from somebody who would really like to tell you to buzz off but doesn't want to be rude to you. Through persistence and luck, I found people and companies who were willing to help. But again, if I was approaching this from the perspective of a, a buyer rather than a researcher, and if I wasn't persistent, I probably would have simply given up because it was difficult to get information. Many Japanese companies are simply not set up to serve non-Japanese clients. And one of the reasons for this is that foreigners, as I mentioned before, are typically a small market. Another is that foreigners are off, often perceived by Japanese companies as being difficult. Uh, because they don't understand or accept the Japanese way of doing things. Um, and also, they want to do things differently. For example, they might want to use a lawyer to assist in the contract negotiations. Uh, they want a contract that spells out every last detail, which is obviously not the way things are done here. Or they might want to hire a building inspector. These things are normal in the West, but not typically done here. Clearly, Japanese companies in Japan have got no obligation to turn themselves inside out to serve foreign customers. But there is money to be made, and some companies, particularly companies in the retail space, like Big Camera and the duty-free stores in Akihabara, uh, are making money serving these customers. I should also say that it's actually it's okay to say, no, I don't want to look after this market segment. Uh, but if your organization isn't interested in these customers, you should find uh, an organization to partner with so you can benefit from referral fees um, and, and generate income that way. If you do want this business, uh, I would recommend that you ensure that your frontline staff, particularly receptionists, are the front first contact for these clients, uh, and your salespeople have the training and the resources they need to do so. Uh, I would also recommend that from the top down, your company perceives this market as an opportunity rather than as, as difficult or, or as being a problem to serve. And don't worry about your English. Uh, I know many Japanese people are, are self-conscious about the quality of their English, but anybody coming here to buy a property, I think, is more than likely to meet you halfway. They're not expecting a language lesson. They're just expecting help. To summarize, You'll be more successful serving foreign buyers if you understand their motivation, if you're prepared to explain the nuances of the Japanese real estate system, and if you have people and processes in place that are actually ready to serve these people. That probably sounds like a lot of work, but I personally believe that it's worth the effort because from a foreigner's perspective, Japan has 10 very powerful attractions. And let me tell you about those. First, in comparison to many places, Japan offers excellent value for money. In Hong Kong, where I live, 8 million Hong Kong dollars, which is roughly 100 million yen or 1 million US dollars, will buy you about 400 square feet, usable square feet, in a 20-year-old building in mid-levels. Uh, that's about 11 subo, 
in a nice but not especially top-end neighborhood. Um, and prices in Singapore, Shanghai, and Beijing are quite similar. Furthermore, property prices in Japan do not correlate with prices in Hong Kong, Singapore, Beijing, and Shanghai. Uh, and that lack of correlation makes property here a very useful addition to a balanced property portfolio. In Japan, it's easy to own freehold land. Contrast that with Hong Kong, where all of the land, except that under the Anglican Cathedral, which you can see here, is owned by the Hong Kong government and leased out uh, by the government to long-term users. Mainland China is similar to Hong Kong, except that no one knows what's going to happen when the government land leases end. In the Philippines and Thailand, foreigners can own condominiums, but they can't own the land underneath the building or a share of it. So all of these things make buying property in Japan for a foreigner quite attractive. Third, Japan doesn't discriminate against foreigners with added taxes or restrictions. In Hong Kong and Singapore, for example, if you are a, a not a citizen or if you're not a permanent resident, you pay higher taxes when you buy property. In, Can in Canada, when a non-resident sells property, the government withholds between 25 and 50 percent of the sale proceeds until the owner can prove that all of the taxes have been paid. And I don't know if you saw it, but uh, earlier this week, the government of British Columbia in Canada imposed a 15 percent tax on foreigners buying property in Vancouver. And that was just in introduced without any warning. Um, in Australia, to give you another example, foreigners cannot buy pre-owned homes without special permission from the, gov from the government. So all of these things, again, contribute to Japan's attraction as a place to buy property. Fourth, Japan's seismic engineering is absolutely superb. And that's not true in many places around the region. For example, in February 2016, after a magnitude 6.4 earthquake hit Taichung, Taiwan, the Weiguang Golden Dragon Building collapsed, killing 114 people. And the reason it collapsed is because when they built it, instead of using concrete in the walls, they used empty cooking oil tins. So when the earthquake happened, the building just collapsed. In the past, Japanese homes were criticized for having a 30-year lifespan under the one home for one generation uh, concept. And today, however, developers are building long lifespan homes and apartments that can be renovated. Uh, and Japanese homes now incorporate environmentally, design, environmentally friendly designs and components uh, like the solar array that you can see on the, the roof of this building. Fifth, for landlords, the high yields in Japan are very, very attractive. Net yields of 5 to 6 percent are relatively easy to obtain. And if you're willing to look at an older building in a less attractive neighborhood, uh, even higher returns are, pro are, are possible. On the other hand, in China's tier one cities, Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen, yields are so low that investors typically leave the interior of new apartments unfinished because the rental return is so low that it doesn't justify the cost of fitting them out, as you can see here. Sixth, Japanese tenants are stable and well-behaved. It's not unusual for people to rent the same apartment for decades. Uh, and from my experience, tenants' demands for improvements and renovations are actually quite modest. And while there are exceptions to every rule, the vast majority of Japanese tenants pay their rents on time with very little in the way of fuss. Seven, Japan is an orderly, law-abiding society. The rule of law is well established, and lawsuits are rare. Contrast that with the United States, where if you buy a rental property, you could find something that's contaminated uh, or that has got a, a criminal problem. There's all kinds of pitfalls there. Uh, furthermore, as Transparency International uh, ranked Japan eight, its 18th least corrupt country in its 2015 survey, and that was well ahead of France, Taiwan, South Korea, and Italy, to name just a few countries. Eighth, Japan offers excellent public infrastructure. If you live in a city like Bangkok, or Jakarta for that matter, the traffic is utterly unmanageable. Japan's efficient, reliable public transportation, by comparison, is an absolute treat. When it comes to culture, festivals like Fuji Rock, as well as Japan's parks, architecture, Michelin-starred restaurants, art museums, concert halls, make Japan a great place to have a pied -a terre if you live in Hong Kong or Taipei or Singapore. Ninth, Japan's reputation as being costly is actually way out of date. Um, Japan actually represents a bargain for many people. 
uh, it's possible, for example, to eat for four uh, adults to eat and drink well for 100 US dollars, and I defy you to try doing that in Singapore. Finally, Japan's blue skies are a welcome relief for people living in cities like Guangzhou, uh, where choking air pollution is very common. And even relatively clean cities like Hong Kong and Singapore can suffer from really, really bad air pollution when the wind blows the wrong way in the wrong season. Those are just a few of the attractions that foreigners see in Japan today. And looking forward, I see three key opportunities for foreigners investing in Japanese properties. One of the most promising, I believe, is tourism. Uh, as you probably know, the Japanese government has set a target of 40 million visitors by 2020 and 60 million visitors by 2030, and is working now to legalize casinos, which are an important attraction to many tourists. But Japan suffers from a chronic shortage of hotel rooms. According to one estimate, with 25 million visitors per year, Japan would still have a shortfall of 10,000 hotel rooms. That represents a tremendous investment opportunity for everything from minpaku hosts to budget hotels and integrated resorts. And tourism investments are made even more attractive by the government's in, uh, intention to increase foreign direct investment in Japan to 35 trillion yen by 2020, more than double the amount recorded in 2012. The second, uh, second, in a part of the world where fresh air and space are at a premium, Japan's rural areas have really great potential. Whether they're used for artist communities, vacation homes, hubs for research and development, or healthcare centers, many of the depopulated communities in Japan offer inexpensive land, transportation infrastructure, and great natural beauty. Furthermore, Japan's tourism push is encouraging people to visit Okinawa, which has excellent scuba diving, and other destinations outside of Tokyo, Osaka, and Kyoto. Immigration reforms will see more skilled and unskilled workers entering Japan, creating even more demand for housing. Finally, there's long-term potential in Japan's agricultural se uh, sector, where the government has set a target of increasing the value of food exports to 5 trillion yen per year by 2030. Japan's expertise in biotechnology, coupled with its reputation for prep producing high-quality seafood and fruits, like the uh, legendary Ichiman-an melons, are an excellent start. Furthermore, Japan has 165 high-tech vegetable factories operated by companies like Mirai Corporation, and this market is set to reach some 30 trillion yen by 2020. So agriculture, I think, has got a great deal of potential. And that's especially true with efficiency, efficiency gains from automation and deregulation and from the consolidation of Japan's many smaller farms into larger, more competitive units. That's also going to help the process, as will the growing wealth of Japan's neighbors as export markets and the passage of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Make no mistake, there are challenges ahead, including the strong yen, an aging and a shrinking population, and the need for more deregulation and regulatory reform. But even with these challenges, I believe there's a growing number of people both today and tomorrow who are going to see the attractions of investing in Japanese real estate. Thank you.